Hello. Got everyone here, looks like. Good afternoon, everyone. Awesome. Thanks all for joining. I'm glad you guys all got the new meeting invites. So how did this week go for you guys? Anything new? New at work? Exciting? Yeah, the first couple of weeks, uh, I knew it was going to be rough, like kind of like really dedicating to the class because I like timing, but yeah back in town and everything i had to uh i had to go to vegas for over a week and uh i was there actually for, like for a fun thing and for a business thing so it was like a right. it was a big thing and also i'm in the process of moving um, oh gosh yeah <laughs> so like yeah, there's like moving to a new apartment i'm still in tustin though on the same like side of town it's just like you know how it is you know moving yeah. and getting around so moving and then going to vegas and stuff so it was it, it's been wow. a, a good one on but uh i've kind of like you know grounded back down into reality now <laughs> that's awesome so yeah. vegas what were you in vegas for obviously um, it worked but um yeah i was there for a for a for a concert and then also there was a um um a convention for like a, a video game that i play and i helped set up stuff at like oh, a great. hotel and stuff like that and like people were competing for money and stuff and i got paid to help out so that's awesome yeah. that's really great i yeah, mean it's no, nice to to kind of get away for a little bit too so yeah yeah but now it's time to buckle down so. yes absolutely <laughs> yeah fantastic great anybody else um do anything awesome this week uh anything crazy at work so i just got engaged <gasps> and to a new place as well so congratulations uh, Beth, I did have a question I emailed you. Uh, I probably won't be able to make the whole meeting. Okay. Uh, is there any way you could send me the recording of the rest of this meeting? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm actually yeah. out of town on a bachelorette party. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> awesome. How fun. How fun. Cool. Yeah. Well, we should be with you, right? <laughs> and enjoy that. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Wow. So someone got engaged this week. How exciting. Hey. Oh, I want to have fun on a bachelor party. That sounds so much fun. Um, no, that's great. Um, so someone got engaged. That's exciting this week. Um, what else happened? Gosh, I like missed out on all the fun. I just worked. Anybody else do anything really good? To be fair, it was a really long week and I got <laughs> off on Thursday. And so I'm like, I needed this vacation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and in general, like, like times right now are just crazy. Like, and, and uh, you know, people are just, a lot extra I feel like I just call it extra you know so yeah I mean it's really good to when you get the moments to just like breathe a little bit just take them you know because it's it's just insane um so yeah you know and that's why like studying right now like it's really hard because you're like working like crazy and then people are being extra and then you got to buckle down to try to study and really focus and um but it is important to take those times to, like time to actually just enjoy yourself and life too um because you can't just be 24 7 like working um because you'll burn out and, and fall over so 
it is important that we do talk about like the good things as well and like what's going on in your guys's life and just like celebrate these moments because um yeah i mean you guys do live outside of vet tech or veterinary medicine too i at least hope so and um, at least a little bit right <laughs> so um but good i'm glad i'm glad you guys have had some good moments too um and not focus just on negative things hopefully um so that's great okay so this week um we kind of are doing some catch up because i know that's really hard like the first three weeks i had a lot of a lot of content i have a cat that's like starting to rub on my computer so you may see him um but we had a lot a lot of content so i just wanted to kind of make sure that you guys um got caught up so we had first pharmacology second um anesthesia and third um surgery um so um we have some surgery content that we can go over today um and so what did you think about surgery anything that pops up at you that i kind of threw at you that thought that was interesting or whatever oh look we got food too yes uh, <laughs> um like great so anything about surgery that you guys thought was interesting maybe didn't know um or have questions about so i was wondering on the vt and do they have questions that are like um like other than cat and dog surgery questions yes like, yes like exotic maybe absolutely so when they talk about surgery it's going to be surgery in in general so there is how they get you on large animal or exotic is that there is nothing in there of, um, of domains that say large animal or exotic. However, when they talk about surgery or um, animal nursing, it doesn't, it could be anything in regards to large animal, exotic, small animal. So that's where some of those questions come in. Now, when we talk about it and you're doing a surgical procedure on a large animal versus a small animal, yes, there are gonna be some differences, but in some cases, a lot of them are gonna be the same, right? Like how are you prepping a large animal patient compared to a small animal patient? Many times they're gonna be very similar um, in that regard. Yes, some of the procedures are different, right? But in some regards, they're going to be very similar too. So just kind of thinking through those is, is really critical. Um, most of, I would say, a lot of your surgery questions are still going to be in regards to small animal, but you can have large animal questions. People think they have a lot of large animal, but I think it's just because it's a little, they are a little anxious about it. <laughs> Um, all right, what other questions do you have? A little bit with the ECGs, like I do okay, like yeah. reading a normal one, but a lot of times like the AV blocks, like figuring out which AV block it is. Yeah. And so, just a little bit. Right, right. So that's a really great question. So, um, AV blocks are hard, you know, like whether it's a first degree AV block, second degree AV block, and third degree AV block. I will tell you this. You mm -hmm. won't have to know that for VT &E, so that's a good thing. Um, but it's so good to like practice these things, especially once you get into the field too. Mm -hmm. um, like calculating ECGs of the heart rate is really good. And that's something to like know for the VT &E, knowing like, what the P wave is, P wave, wave is, sorry, I can't even talk. P wave is, um, QRS and then T wave is, is like kind of where you are for vt &E. So that's like beginner um, CVT. Once you get into the field and like seeing more and more cases and stuff and like being able to be like, oh, that is a VPC, that is an AV block, um, that is, you know, um, atrial fib and stuff that is like starting to become more and more like intermediate to advanced technician 
I love introducing that to you guys now because I feel like it's pushing you in that direction already. Um, and I want to keep pushing you, um, especially since you guys need to be already, I guess, technicians that can just jump into the field, you know? So don't get too frustrated if you're like, I have no idea what an AV block looks like, you know, or whatever. Um, but it's really good to know like what flutter looks like versus what atrial fib looks like, you know, or what, uh, what a VPC looks like. Right. Um, so that is, that is really good stuff to know. And that's what makes you really valuable in a, in a practice, you will absolutely get what AV block uh, looks like eventually, but AV block essentially looks like, Hey, I'm missing my QRS. Right. Um, essentially. So, and, and then the degrees is essentially how advanced it continues to be. So, um, how did it go with counting your, um, heart rates? Cause we did that last time, right? Kind of at the end. I like did that really fast for you guys. Did you guys all do pretty well with? Can we like go over like one more time? I don't know why, but I was having a hard time with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, let me find some ECG um, pictures and we will do that. I don't know why, but like for some reason, like keeping like all the equations, like the different equations that we have to do is like hard to keep in my head. <laughs> you will, know. the more and more you do it, like repetitively over and over again, the more and more you'll remember. So, um, it just, I don't know. It just sticks after a while of just, you know, like problems that you do, you know, and that kind of thing. So I know it's hard to like, just be like, oh my gosh, how, how do you remember like maintenance fluids and stuff? Well, after you do that, you know, maintenance fluids on animals, 8 million times, you just remember <laughs> that that's what it is, you know, or um, how do you do, how do you remember, you know, how to do it, count an ECG or whatever. You just remember after so long, like I can remember what the dose is for animals for like Patrol and, and metronidazole. And I know the concentration for all those drugs, like in my head. And that's only because I've worked in the field for way too many years now, you know? So it's just like, it's in my head because I've just done it so long or maybe because I just know numbers. I don't know, but you'll, you'll just remember after time. So, okay. So let's kind of review again. Um, what are our two, um, what are our two speeds that we use in our two main speeds, I should say, that we use on ECGs. Do we remember? Is it 20 and 50? Who close? So we have 50 millimeters per second. So you got that one. You're very close on the other one. 25? 25, good, 25 millimeters per second. So remember that each of those little tiny boxes is equals one millimeter in, in that space. So that means that there's five of these little tiny boxes in that big box right there. Right. 
So if there's five of those in that little tiny box, to get one second, how many of those big boxes do I need to count to get one second in the 50? How many big boxes? So if I count one of these boxes, that's five boxes there. I need 50 little boxes. How many do I need to get 50? 10. So, right, 10. So 10 big boxes equals one second, right? All right, so if I want 25 little boxes to get one second, how many do I need to count? So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. That would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So 5 big boxes equals one second. So the reason why we're counting seconds, right? is because when we listen to a heartbeat on our patient, we're counting seconds to get to 60 seconds, right? Essentially. But how, how many seconds do we actually listen to? Some people six or 10, yeah. some people do 15. Right, right, it's like variable, right? But we're listening to a number of seconds, right? So here we're doing the exact same thing, but we just don't have, we have a variable amount of seconds, but our goal is to eventually get 60 seconds or a minute, right? Because in our heart rate, we get beats per minute. So we need a minute's worth of a heartbeat, right? So what we're gonna do here is we're going to count the number of seconds we have, and then we're gonna multiply a factor in order to get a minute worth, just like we would for a heartbeat, okay? So that's our first step in this problem. Before we even look at the ECG is that we're going to count how many seconds we actually have, okay? So I actually cut off the picture a little bit. So this actually was a full box, so we can count that. So let's count this and let's do it as a 50 millimeter, 50 millimeter per second first, okay? So if we count this box as one, so one box, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, that is one second worth right there, right? Then we count this again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's two seconds. And then we have one, two, three, and that would be four. This is not enough to count it as anything, right? So we just leave that out. So we have two seconds. So we need, right, 60 seconds right? Because that's, we need a minute's worth of stuff. But we only have, in our problem here, we only have, where's my phone, have two seconds. So this is going to be figuring out our multiplication factor right here. Because just like when we listen to our patient, if we figure out a multiplication factor. If we're listening to our patient, we're listening to 15 seconds. And then when we get our 15 seconds, we get a multiplication factor that we to, to multiply to get 60 seconds, right? So if we listen to 15 seconds, what do we multiply to get 60? Four, right? So we do the exact same thing when we listen to our patient. If we listen to six seconds, we multiply by 10. So we're already doing that in our head when we listen to our patient. Now we have, we're doing it by looking at a piece of paper. So here we put need, we need 60 seconds, we have two. So our multiplication factor here is 30, right? 
So our next step after we have our multiplication factor is we go, now we're gonna count our R waves, okay? And then once we get our R waves, we're gonna multiply our R waves by our multiplication factor, which is 30. And that's gonna get us our beats per minute. All right, so now we just have to count our R waves. So our R waves are P, Q, R, S, and T. So our R waves are up here. R, 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 and R. Everything that's within these spaces, okay? So we have one, two, three, four, and five, right? So five R waves times 30 equals? 150. 150 beats per minute. Does that make sense? Is it, um, is it always 30 because you only have two seconds and you're like dividing it by, by a minute? Because you can only see two seconds on there. Correct. So you're okay. always going to need 60 seconds, right? Yeah. And then you're going to divide it by what you have. So whatever you have counted is going to be what you have. Okay. So if there's like a little bit more and you could make a third second, it would be divided. By Correct. Three. Yes. Yeah. So if you had an extra second in there, it would be divided by three seconds. Or if yeah. you had 15 seconds, it'd be 15. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So mean? for a proper ECG, what what time? So you have to do a minute of heartbeat? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So just like when you're just like if you were listening to your heartbeat, right? You're listening to your heartbeat for 15 seconds and then you are multiplying by four because you want 60 seconds, right? It's the same thing, it's just out on on a piece of paper. All right, now let's look at this ECG. This is the hard part, right? We just did the easy part. Oh gosh, that was the easy part. <laughs> what does this look like? All right, we have a P wave, right? The P wave looks good, it looks pretty. The QRS, and then there's a T wave. There's a P wave for every QRS, and then there's a QRS for every T, right? So what would we call this ECG? Normal. Normal, right? Normal what? Normal sinus rhythm. Good, normal sinus rhythm. Very good. Awesome. Any questions on that one? Now, if we did this one at 25 millimeters per second, all right? So say we have our box there, okay? We're starting out here because I cut it off. Let's do... How many boxes do we count? Big boxes. We're counting five big boxes per second, right? So we're gonna count one, two, three, four, five. So that's one second. Make that look pretty. Then one, two, three, four, five, two seconds. One, two, three, four, five, three seconds. One, two, three, four, five, four seconds. Ooh, sorry, make that. One, two, three, four. Oh, we didn't get enough for that. Darn, right? So what's our next step from there? We have four seconds. Dividing the 60 by four. Good, so we take our 60 seconds, because that's what we need. And then we have four seconds. So our multiplication factor is what? Fifteen. 
15, good. So our next step after that is to do what? Count your R waves. Count our R waves, good. So we'll, we're gonna count one, two, three, four, five. So that doesn't change, right? So we have five R waves and then we're gonna do what? Multiply that by 15. Multiply by 15 and what do you get? 75. 75 beats per minute. So what would you say this is? Like a, a normal ECG, but um, bradycardia. Ooh, is it bradycardia? Well, on the lower end. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's a Great Dane? Uh, well, then it's, then it's normal, I guess. Like for, <laughs> I mean, yeah. True, true. If it's a cat, then, we're, then you're right, right? <laughs> it's a trick question. Beth and her I, made it, I made it work. <laughs> right, right. You're like, um, what if it's a rat? Then we're screwed, right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Beth and her trick questions. All right, let me try to find another one for you. I'll try to find a really hard one. Not really a hard one, but a harder one. All righty. Oh, and I cut off I cut off the boxes again. Darn myself. Okay. Alrighty. To share. Okay. So this one says it's 25 millimeters per second on the bottom and we are on lead two. Is that the correct lead we should be on? Ooh. What is the correct lead we should be on? The one. Oh. Good question, I guess. Huh? Anyone know? What is like our normal lead that we have our patients on? In general practice, I say don't like not cardiology. Cardiology looks at all the leads. Five. Oh. Good guess. Let me see if I don't find a picture. Of course, it'll be a human one, even though it means the same thing. I don't really like that picture, but. All right, it'll do. I'm not a huge fan of the picture, but it'll do. Um, share with you guys. Okay, so these are the 12 leads that we have, okay? Um, lead two is right here, all right? So it goes all the way through the heart this way, all right? So, um, this is, remember, the electrode leads, okay? So essentially, when you hook up your leads, 
it is taking the um a picture of essentially the electrical um picture of the heart so we like to look at lead two because we are seeing the SA node working, the AV node working, and all the way through the heart that way, all right? So if we're looking at the other um, leads itself, they're great, but at the same time, we're not seeing obviously the SA node and the AV node as well. Um, so we like, this is like the best one for us to be able to see, okay? So sometimes people put it on lead one because they, didn't, they don't know better. Um, you'll see sometimes people put it on lead three accidentally. So we just need to make sure that it's on lead two when we put it on. So we see the best picture of the heart. If we accidentally have it on a different lead, uh, we'll actually see our ECD change in how it looks. And it kind of freaks us out because um, our ECG looks a little wonky. So, okay. Um, so for this one, let's figure out how we're going to do this. So we have 25 millimeters per second. So how many big boxes are we going to count per second? Five. Five. Great. So let's start at this box because I cut it off. So we are going to do one two, three, four, five. And then let's see how many boxes or how many seconds you guys get. So you can go ahead and do that. All right, so you know, how many seconds do you guys get? Now that you can see my screen. Four. Four seconds. Good. All right. So what's our next step? Counting the R way. Okay. If we count the R waves, we can count the R waves, sure. But before we count the R waves, what should we do with our seconds? We need to figure something else out too with our seconds. Do 60 divided by four. Oh, God. We should figure out our multiplication factor, right? So yeah, we need to figure out our multiplication factor. So we take 60 seconds, divide by four, right? And what's our multiplication factor? 15. 15 again, right? All right, now our R waves. You just got really excited about those R waves. Okay, so we're gonna count all the R waves that are within this location and then obviously this location, or I guess it was slightly above, but whatever, all of this. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. How about you have 10, mm -hmm. 10 R waves. And then we multiply that by 15 and you get 150. Awesome, 150 feet per minute. All right, so now the big question, what is wrong with this ECG? Or is something wrong with this ECG? There's no U wave. I'm sorry, there's no what? U wave. U wave, okay. Good guess. Anything else? It's like you're missing a complex in there. Okay. Oh, like a, like a QRS? QRS. Okay. Like, like around the three, four mark. Yeah. Like right here. Yep. Yeah. Like it's definitely, well, throughout this whole thing, right? There's, it's not uniform, correct? 
Mm-hmm. And it's doing its own thing. There's a definite weird rhythm. You're right. What else is wrong? Is there a P wave in there or a T wave in there? It's like there's multiple. Okay, good. Yeah, it, it definitely is hard to tell, right? What is what does BFib look like? Very sporadic. It's like a bunch of like squigglies. Yeah, squiggly mm-hmm. lines. So VFib looks like this, right? That's what you're describing. Yeah. So does that kind of look like what you're describing minus the QRS. Just, it looks like this, right? Except you have a QRS in there. Go away. So Brady, bradycardia? No, because remember, bradycardia is you're gonna have a low heart rate. Oh, tachy, tachycardia. Uh, tachycardia, you have to have something greater than 180 beats per minute. Would it be AFib? Oh, why AFib? Because I'm missing that P and Q is just getting that low wiggling down at the bottom because you've got the QRS, which would be a ventricular yeah. contraction. Yes, 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 yes. Good. Yes. Now we're on to something. Good. So the P wave equals atrial issues, right? The QRS equals ventricular issues yeah so we know here that our qrs looks fine right but something is wrong here with the p waves like p does not look good and so it can't be ventricular fibrillation it can't be um you know uh, VPCs or anything like that. So that's off the table. So a ventricular, we're done with. Now we have to look at atrial issues. Now, when I said, oh, what does VFib look like? This does kind of look like VFib, just like a fine VFib, right? So it could be AFib, afibulation, meaning the heart being the atrium is fibrillating, right? So our atrial Oh, it's not drawing. So our atrium, oh, let me stop sharing. Stop. Um, it's essentially just fibrillating like this, like the atrium itself is just fibrillating and it doesn't want to pump appropriately, right? So it's not the whole heart fibrillating, just the atrium. And so it's fibrillating, but then the ventricle is still pumping. So that's what it looks like on our ECG. Make sense? So that's how you can tell what is what on ECG. If the QRS looks fine, then we know that our ventricle is okay. Okay. If our P wave is looking messy, then we know that it's an atrial issue. Now, I love the fact that you said it was um, AFib versus people confuse AFib with another issue. What is that other issue? Would it be sinus arrhythmia? Ooh, close. No, not, I mean, but I could see where people get sinus arrhythmia in this part, but oh God, you're going to make me draw. Um, they consider this one. It's like, looks like a sawtooth.
What is that? Is that blue tack? No. Be like a flaw. Flutter. Uh, it sounds like shoes in a dryer. Anyone ever heard that? Did your teachers talk about atrial flutter? Yes, no, maybe. So maybe. people can people confuse flutter and atrial fibrillation because they think of fluttering as this like pretty thing, you know, and atrial fib looks like a little bit prettier than flutter. Like flutter is really angry looking. So just remember that flutter in the heart is angry. It's not a pretty thing. So. So basically, when I learned about uh, the different arrhythmias, the only one that they really like described to me it sounds was like the machine. Is that the one that you're talking about? I'm sorry. What? It sounds kind of like a machine roaring. Uh, machine. Oh, it sounds like tennis shoes and a dryer flutter. Yeah, like, like it's just like weird banging noise in our heart. All right. So for ECGs, do you guys feel a little bit more comfortable with heart rate? Yes. A little bit better? Okay. It takes like it's just a little bit more practice. Um, there's a couple I know like quizzes um, they put online so that you guys can um, answer those. And if you guys need additional help, I'm happy to help you with those. Obviously, like in practice now, we don't have to do them too much, um, especially unless you're like working in specialty and have to do them. Um, once in a while we have to do them, but our machines are so great now that they honestly do them for us. But again, on the BTE, &E, they like to ask these questions here and there. So it's really good to know it. All right, awesome. So for surgery, um, let's see. What did I want to ask you guys today? I wanted to ask you some fun stuff. Um, Let's talk about some of, oh, some of the things that you guys saw. Did any of you guys see this, the PAW project? Did any of you watch it? Or have seen it before? Not yet. Yeah. You're in Vegas, so, or whatever, so. <laughs> It's a really good documentary, honestly, like if you guys have a chance to watch it or even just watching it with a family member or something too, it's actually really good to just be able to watch it with anyone. It's not like, it's not like super veterinary related. Lisa, since you have your students too, they actually might like it too. Um, it's really interesting because I honestly didn't know too much about um, how it's about decline, okay? Um, mm -hmm. And obviously it's a huge topic right now um, as well, um, especially since there's been a lot like that has come about, especially like BCA that have stopped doing declaws. Um, what it was in 2020 when they did that um, and stuff too. So, but the, it, it's a, gosh, the, it's probably about at least five years old this, um, this uh, documentary, but the main topic about it was that um, big cats are being declawed 
for like Hollywood purposes and stuff. Um, and so like the big cat that was in, oh gosh, The Hangover. Um, if you guys saw that movie, um, okay. that cat was declawed. Mm -hmm. And only for the purpose of the fact of like, that they wouldn't get obviously scratched or hurt or whatever. But the problem with that is um, there are not declawed appropriately. Um, and the tendons obviously are like being broken so that these cats are not able to walk appropriately. And they end up getting severe arthritis after so long to the point where like, they're not able to walk to their water dishes and they end up eventually dying because they can't actually walk to get enough water and get renal failure and die. And it's just horrible. So That's this, I know it's so terrible. So this veterinarian took this project on to, she put her own money into it to like actually like reattach their tendons. Um, and the cats can actually like maneuver their feet to like use you know to like their their paws to Do cat stuff. scratching motion again and and everything um and she's like fix all these cats and then she went on to like go to california to to ban declawing and all of this stuff too so it kind of like made this movement come along so um it's been really it was a really interesting topic conversation especially in my class of why do we declaw what are some options to declawing um, or outside of declawing um, and like is it needed in certain circumstances you know um, and, and that truly there are some people that are very much like nope we need to declaw all cats and and then we had a conversation of why do you feel that way? You know, like, so it was a good um, topic of conversation. So, um, but I did not know that people do that to big cats in, in Hollywood. So um, if you don't so, want your stuff scratched, just don't get a cat. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, oh, I heard that it's better when they do it with a laser, but if you use like a guillotine to cut, yeah. it has the potential like, where bones can be left in there and yep. then they can tend to regrow. Yeah, right. So you should see in this documentary, like they literally went in and went back into the feet and it was literally like a marble that they pulled out of each toe, like this huge like bone that they just pulled out of each toe that just like regrew. And I'm like, oh my God, these, these animals are like walking on mar like just big rocks every day of, of that. Like granted, this is a large cat, but if you think about like our house cats that, you know, they, they then walk on that as well, just to a different size, but it's still, you know. They said the laser wasn't any better in the video. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think that it you know like I think that they're able to get into that certain space a little bit differently but um granted like pain wise I don't think that it's still going to be a painful procedure you know so the tendon thing they showed was really awful where they yeah. just cut the tendons and let the toes flap that was yeah gross. absolutely absolutely I was just like mortified like oh my gosh so um but I, ha it, I haven't seen the movie but I know that in New York it's now yeah um, legally you can't do it yeah at all but um in discussion with some of my graduates who are in other states they were talking about doing tendonectomies more regularly like that's yeah. almost more common practice and I was surprised and I was wondering if that was covered also by the laws like if they're both not a lot or just the onchiectomy where you're cutting the the section of the digit off is not allowed. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it is, you know, a, a well discussed topic. I would like to take a look at that. Yeah, I'd have to look in California of what they have actually done if they have outlawed both of those. 
um, versus just decline. Um, because I mean, I think the tendinectomy is also a little bit crazy. I would, I would think they would do both, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. how the law is actually written. So if there's like right. a back door essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And I know like St. Louis, they have outlawed that too. And it's interesting because I mean, in St. Louis, it's just in St. Louis. So if people want to really declaw their cat, they just go outside of drive Louis. a town. Yeah. So, exactly. um, I mean, yes, there's going to be loopholes and stuff like that too, but it's a work in progress. Right. So, Most definitely. Um, but it, it is, it is making it harder because now like VCA is not allowing it, which is huge because right. VCA is very big. Um, and then other corporations are starting to follow suit. So it's, it's getting there slowly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought it was a really good eye opener and really great discussion to have um, of, okay, well, what are some other options and why like our client communication is suffering then because we don't take enough time to talk to them about, you know, scratching and stuff like what do we offer to owners like about scratching because they ask these questions like they're scratching my couch what can I do do we even know about cat behavior then like um what are some of the things that we that we tell them we just say get a scratching post but what does that mean we're big on offering soft paws at my clinic. Oh, I love soft paws. Yeah. Oh, um, we don't tell them to anywhere to go, and then, you know, we have a we. You'd be surprised how many people you explain to what declawing is, and they don't know either, and then they feel terrible and they don't want to do it. So, do you guys do soft paws at your clinic? Yeah, we do. Oh, good. Okay, I was gonna say like that's a huge money maker right there, and and that's the other thing. There there were veterinarians. Okay, in that video, who were like the decline cats is a huge money maker for us do you know how much money you can make off the of soft boss if if that is your if that's your argument right mm -hmm. decline your argument should really be then back you can make more money off of soft boss like in, in a whole lifetime <laughs> you know right right yeah and it's a lot more fun like look at all the colors you could do like you have halloween you have christmas you have glitter you know it's so much better um you know nail trims alone you make more money off of It'd be just in nail trims you would make more money off of that so um but how about scratching posts like we say get a scratching post okay how many different varieties of scratching posts are there Right? You can like, do like crazy. the, the cat trees, you can do like the cardboard ones, they have like door mats that you can hang up and all kinds of stuff. Whether right. it be like cloth or you know, cardboard, you know, carpet, whatever, but it's a good a good way to redirect the cat's attention that you need to praise them for right. using the correct spot. And not every cat likes the same scratching post, right? Right. So you might have to get a couple different ones and see what your that specific cat likes. So pe people can get really frustrated with cats because cats are very particular, right? So um, it's our job to educate owners on on these types of things. So um, so yeah, that's part of the surgery discussion too is sure we can do these elective surgeries but do we need to like they are elective right but we're tending not to want to do them as much as possible because we don't necessarily need to in all cases now it's spaying and spaying and neutering an animal on elective surgery Yes, and I had just realized that I was doing like a vet tech prep. I was answering some questions this past week. 
and I didn't realize that, that was like considered an elective surgery, which I mean, I guess it makes sense, but like, I didn't really think that that's what it was considering we pushed so highly for it here, at least in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an elective surgery because it's not technically necessary, right? We just, yeah, but obviously, and everything and absolutely. yeah, there's just a lot of risk factors to not having, uh, not being spayed and neutered and all of, all of that jazz. Right. But, um, so it is highly recommended to spay and neuter, but we don't have to, like an owner doesn't have to, you know, they, they don't have to elect to do that if they don't want to. So, um, it is an, it is technically an elective surgery. Now in Europe, many people don't spay and neuter their animals, um, if they don't need to. So it's very different. Um, okay. What age do we typically recommend spaying and neutering? This is kind of a weird question. For us, Isn't it depends it usually on the size depends of the animal. Weight of the animal. Yeah, it's kind of the it depends on the animal per se, right? So, like, what if we have a? Oh gosh. Um, the smallest animal we, the smallest dog. Usually about six months long. Okay. What is the range you'd say? Like uh, the very weeks. earliest. Oh gosh, like eight weeks. I six to nine eight months. Weeks. I would not, I would never spay an animal at eight weeks. Never. I know. So many shelters do. Yeah. Well, and so here's the deal with shelters. So now in most cases, shelters can't adopt out an animal unless um, they are spayed or neutered. So I guess I don't consider, I'm not going to consider shelters in this mix. Um, so they do like, like they have to be two pounds or more or whatever, like that's their deal. So I'm not going to consider those guys. So, um, let's consider like owned pets already <laughs> on the, that end. So, um, but so yeah, what about the, the little, our smallest animals? What do we kind of recommend? There's kind of a range waiting until they're like eight to nine months or even okay yeah yeah so we usually say like six to nine months would be awesome right um so giving them some time to develop great how about some so of our females you want to give them time to develop but you also want to try to get them before that first heat that cycle first... perfect perfect yeah so what happens if we wait until after that first heat cycle why why do we want to Get them before the first heat cycle. Increases chance of mammary cancer. Right. What is the risk of that? You're gonna, do you know? I mean, I don't know my, so I have an 18 year old cat and I never spayed her when I got her because she was a runt and I always worried. And at yeah. 17, she got hydrometra. So. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Yeah. So she had, she got spayed at 17 and she's still yeah. here. She'll be 18 on Halloween. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So if they are spayed before they are their first heat cycle, there is a 10% chance that they could get mammary gland carcinoma, um, which is pretty good. If they wait until their first heat cycle and then get spayed, they have a 50% chance of mammary gland carcinoma. So chances go up pretty significant, right? Um, so yeah, uh, so we definitely want to try our best to get them spayed before the first heat cycle. Um, some people um, used to do, they used to wait until after the first heat cycle. That used to be like the thing, but now we, now we don't do that. Um, what about our bigger animals, our bigger dogs? What do, what is our kind of? Typically a year to a year and a half. Okay. 
stage to help that orthopedic development. Great. What about like our giant breed dogs? Probably after like 18 months. 18 months to two years, right? So yeah, our giant breed dogs, they take two years to develop completely, right? So yes, their bone grows, they fill out until they're about two years old, all of that. So they need all those hormones and everything to be able to grow ideally, right? So if we spayed them, like we used to spayed and neutered them at six months, that's what we used to do. It was shown that they start or they continue to just can grow up and never fill out. So their bones kept growing um, straight up and elongated their bones rather than actually like filling their bodies out. So we just had really like a uh, long uh, strangly looking dogs. And so if you looked at the animals that would come into your clinic, like mastiffs and you know, these um, Great Danes and stuff like that. And then you looked at the show dogs on TV, you'd be like, why do they look entirely different? Or even golden retrievers were a good one. They looked completely different. And a lot of it was the fact that their hormone hormones were completely imbalanced and making them grow very differently. So I just recommended that, hey, let's give them some time to actually grow and fill out their bodies and then spay and neuter them, right? We need hormones to be able to grow. Yeah, I um, have a boxer puppy and I don't plan to neuter him until he's probably about two and a half, three, yeah. which is kind of, <laughs> my boss isn't too happy about it, but it's my decision. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, it is hard because you do have to kind of deal with some of that like backlash of things and especially you with a boxer right you have things to worry about with boxers they are known for issues <laughs> so you know long long issues like down the road you know they are known to have cancer and heart issues and stuff like that so it is a really good idea to like make sure hey I want them to grow appropriately and um, have those hormones to hopefully help prevent some of those issues down the road. Who knows um, if that is going to help, but it's, it's not going to hurt either, right? Yeah. Like, we want to try our best to help in that regard. Now, if you have an animal who is unneutered and marking all over the place and just being completely like, obnoxious and ruining your life and whatever and you can't take it anymore yeah absolutely 100 neuter them right like you know stop making your life miserable but if you can help it like absolutely try to do it so i did um put on Mo your moodle page there's like a study that has been going on since like 1970 of doing um vasectomies and ovio uh, spays and stuff like that too. Um, and where they have looked at some of these breeds like Goldens, Bernice Mountain Dogs, um, animals that have, uh, have been known to getting certain types of cancer so that they have um, these hormones within their bodies for um, their entire lives to help try to prevent some of these cancers that are like very well known to them and it's shown a significant amount of decrease of, of re obviously reducing these cancers um but one thing is that when you leave um one ovary in there or doing a vasectomy you do have to i'm sorry not a vasectomy but when you leave an ovary you have to be um cautious of one thing of that they can still get mammary gland carcinoma as well. So it's a balance. Like, do you take that risk? Right. Um, or do you just do a full on spay? So if you have a, a really good attentive owner who looks over their dog all the time and, you know, is like, okay, I noticed like a mass on their abdomen. We're going to take a peek at it. We can biopsy it and all of that. Awesome. And there's obviously that 50% chance risk, right? 
Um, but if you have like a golden retriever who can get lymphoma, like at the age of two, it might be worth it to, to try it. So it's really up to the owner and giving them all the options that they may have. So it's very hard to find an, a veterinarian that will do it though. So. so I wanted to present you guys with that information though, just cause it was, it's fun. It's fun to look at. Um, okay, so in some of our surgery stuff, so I have in there how to scrub, how to gown, how to um, surgically like prep and stuff like that. When you guys scrub in for surgery, how many of you guys actually scrub in for surgery right now? Any of one? Or have no. you scrubbed in? I've done it at school, but I haven't okay. done it in practice. Awesome. Yeah, I scrub one um, pretty frequently. I've scrubbed in for TPLOs. Yeah. Yeah, I've gotten to scrub in for an amputation, but otherwise I don't do it very often. Great. Any of you guys, when you guys scrub, do you guys do like your five minute scrub of your hands or do you guys use like Avogard or do you know what Avogard is? We use five minute scrub. Okay. We have Avogard. Avogard, great. Do all of you guys know what Avogard is? What's Avogard? <laughs> let me let me find a let me find a picture of it. It is gonna save your hand, your arm and hands lives. Um It made me realize that when I was teaching surgical scrubbing that I was wasting my time because all you have to do is literally just put it on your hands and you're ready to go. Well, it's almost like a little <laughs> bottle. You just like push it and it squirts out a little thing on the wall. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we have that because the one the one doctor uses that, but the other one is allergic to it. So he does. Oh, regular. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, this is what Avogard looks like, okay, in, in some fashion. So it's kind of like this little triangle-y thing, okay? Um, some of them are have an automatic pump that you can do, and then there's some other ones that it has a foot pedal pump. And so you do the first squirt, essentially, is for like your fingertips or fing and finger or whatever. And then um, you just rub it all over your hands. So it's made out of like alcohol and um, chlorhexidine. And then the second squirt you do like your hands and then your wrists and arms or whatever. And you just let it like dry onto your, your um, hands and arms and then you're done. Like you don't have to do any type of additional scrubbing or anything. And Absolutely. then you can, you, then you can glove, or I'm sorry, then you can gown and glove up and that's it. So the whole five minute scrub <laughs> for nothing. Um, <laughs> I know it's crazy. So um, typically what I do is I at least like wash my hand, obviously wash your hands first and then do it. Um, but the nice thing is, is it's really nice on your hands and stuff because you don't have to actually scrub for each surgery because those, the scrubs after a while, they're making micro abrasions on your hands and you don't really realize it after a while. So um, this is at least a little bit uh, nicer. So um, unless you're allergic to it, then definitely don't do it. There are some other brands out there that your doctor may not be allergic to, so they can always try that. The only reason why people use Avogard specifically is that this one is FDA approved. So, but big deal to me at least. So, um, uh, so yeah, um, that's really nice. If you guys don't have it in practice, it saves a lot of time and it's again, really nice on your hands. So, um, so I recommend it. Um, what do you guys wear when you go into surgery? Like as a as a anesthetist. Anything? Well, I do 
I do mobile now, so I don't get to do surgery anymore, but we Ooh. Used to, I know I miss it. <laughs> um, but we used to wear, you know, the head dressing, the booties. Sometimes they'd make us wear like a disposable gown, okay. glove right. up, stuff like that. Great. And we all wear masks now. So that's like mask, part of yeah. our attire. So um, perfect. And then for surgical prepping, well, how do you guys surgically prep your patients? Like, do you do it inside well, surgery or outside surgery? Yeah, we would do, we would prep them outside and we would do the three scrub of Chlorhex, three scrub of alcohol. And then when we would move them to the surgery suite, then we do another scrub of alcohol and Chlorhex. Great. Now your inside surgery, do you guys do a sterile prep inside surgery where you like wear sterile gloves and then have sterile gauze and stuff to prep them? Yeah, I worked at an AHA accredited ah. hospital. So yeah, we used to do the sterile very good very good i like that you mentioned that so i worked for i worked for aha uh -huh. yes i was a practice consultant for aha uh -huh. so that is definitely what we recommended was that sterile prep anyone else do that too well, my hands are much healthier now that i don't have to use chlorhexidine as often <laughs> yes Chlorhexidine can be very, very drying, especially, and alcohol too, right? So, um, you know, even if you're doing like your outside prep, right? Wearing just gloves in general is very good. Um, just to kind of, not only is a cleaner, but also to save on your hands. So yeah, can be very drying. Um, great. And then um let's see for surgery patients um are patients intubated for surgery do we intubate all of them I, we do everything pretty much but cat neuters okay how about everybody else yeah we used to intubate every surgical procedure fantastic yeah, everything gets intubated. Yeah. We intubate everything. How about IV catheters? We do a lot of IV catheters in derm, and then we don't like intubate and then anesthetize like everything. We do like a lot of local and then. Good. Yeah. But like there's definitely procedures where we like intubate and anesthetize and stuff like videotoscopies and like stuff like that. And um, like really like bad fractious cats, we just box them down first and then we mask them, stuff like that. Oh, yeah. so why boxing? Um, that's just like what they do there. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah. So that's your goal is to talk them into doing some sort of anesthetic protocol outside of boxing, right? Like what, what are some other ways that we could, um, and, and I say this a lot, so it's not like to pick on you. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. to be fair, I've only seen it like twice okay. in the like, yeah. past year. So it's not like a regular. Yeah. Practice. It's not regular, but yeah, like in general. So like, um, and as you guys know, like we, if you see a cat or any animal be boxed down, like they go through stage two for such a long time, right? So it's just not safe. Plus you don't have an airway while they're in there. So like something could happen. So like, what are some other ways that can make it safer for them to go down? Like what is a better protocol that we could use? So um, that's they can prescribe mm -hmm. gabapentin prior to the surgical procedure. That way the cat is a little more right. relaxed. Yeah. So if we knew, if we knew that, yeah, they were going to be in naughty pants, then we could have <laughs> given them gabapentin, right? But say we didn't know that they were going to be naughty, right? What, what could we do? You'd like have to postpone surgery and then send them home with gabapentin and then try sure. to get another day. Yeah, yeah, you could Which, absolutely. Realistically, do that. we could have, you know, have done something like that. Sure. 
What if you were like, like, like nope, we're gonna injections? I'm sorry, what? We do like an IM injection. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. What, and then what's your IM? My doctor's a fan of midazolam to kind of chill him out. Ooh, yeah. That's a good one. Midazolam will chill him out a bit. What else? Some telazol. Telazol. What else is in your telazol? You know, I do mobile now, so we don't get to use <laughs> <laughs> no, gonna... We don't get to play with that many drugs. No. We only have a few. Okay. But we do teals on ACE for our euthanasia. Yeah. I hate that combo. I'm sorry. But I get that you don't have like a lot to play with. So um, but if you had everything to choose from, say you did, what could we do with our cat? What about DKT? Oh, wait, what did you just say? DKT. Yes, um, there you go. Kitty magic, man. Which can also be given orally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. If you can get to their mouth, let's say they're like coming at your face, right? <laughs> they're coming for your jugular. You can put a catheter tip on the end of your syringe. Okay, there you go. Creativity. Yeah, there you go. That's interesting. I really like that. Well, thanks for the options, guys. I have used the one yeah. and a half inch needle on the end too. Have you used the long needle? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty interesting. She's like, dart them. <laughs> no, I mean that's great. Like, and you know, like we, gosh, you know, just putting sure pushing them in the back of the kennel and giving them IM. But that's great to even think of, you know, doing it that way too. Of any anything that we can let them sit, and I always say sit and marinate, you know, and and just relax so that we we don't create. Um, that long excitement phase, because then, then you're going to go through surgery or anesthesia, and it's going to be like this up and down uh, battle with them throughout, you know, so um, it's just a little crazy, but, mm -hmm. but no, I mean, and, and it's like a little bit more progressive in, in our medicine as well. So, um, but I mean, I'm glad that you guys don't have to do it too often either. So that's good. And you're right too. You don't have to do it that day. You could always send them home on gabapen and hopefully that it works, you know, that they come back a little bit more relaxed and, you know, nothing, nothing is a rush per se. Like nothing's an emergency necessarily in derm, you know, just like I say Very in true. general practice too, <laughs> nothing seems to be an emergency today. So it's not a big deal, but um, no, very good guys. That's awesome. Um, all right. So how about anyone have ethylene oxide sterilization at their practice? Or do they just have, um, your, your steam sterilizers, autoclaves? Autoclaves. Your autoclaves. Where do you guys keep those autoclaves? Um, honestly, like I just bag, like we clean and then we spray everything and then we bag it up and then the surgery suite does all of our autoclaving and they bring it to us when it's done. Great. Where do they store the autoclave? Like, is it, is it in like your treatment area? Is it? Oh, they have like their own little like room for them. There's like several of them. Awesome. And they got their own space. Yeah. Perfect. Anyone have it in their surgical suite? No? Good. Very good. Then I don't have to yell at you. <laughs> Great. Let's, let's see. Let me give you guys Let's talk about some test questions. All right. Um, so an infection along tissue planes that can arise postoperatively is called what?
So you want me to give you options? Or can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Infection along tissue planes that can arise postoperatively is called what? I have plantitis, cellulitis, phlebitis, or dehiscence? Cellulitis. Cellulitis. Very good. All right. Um, ooh, this is good. Animals that suffer from GDV usually are in shock. Uh, this type of shock is classified as what? Hypovolemic. Ooh. So why hypovolemic? Someone want to help me out here? <laughs> good job. He's like, I just know it's hypovolemic. Even though I spelled hypovolemic wrong, but I don't know what's What happens during a GDV? Their stomach twists. Okay, good. And so when it twists, is it just the stomach that twists sometimes? Like what else twists with it? Oh, because organs aren't getting enough like oxygen and blood. Mm, yes. So if they're not getting enough blood, your organs start to die off. Yeah. And there's not enough plasma. There's not enough of volume, right? going to everything. So it becomes hypovolemic. They're in hypovolemic shock, right? So they're trying to freak out. So we need to do something in order to fix that shock at that present moment, right? So hypovolemic shock doesn't necessarily always mean they're bleeding out somewhere or they, um, you know, are a raisin right now because of vomiting and diarrhea, but it can also mean like there's, there's not enough fluid going to those particular tissues at the present moment. So chrysaloids. Right. So you could do chrysaloids and colloids at that present moment to get blood pressure up because blood pressure has dropped because there's not anything going to where it needs to go. Um, and we also need to flip the stomach somehow, right? Or we need to release the gas that's in the stomach. So what we typically do in GDV cases is we pass a tube, if possible, into the stomach to relieve the pressure. And so that some, at least, of the blood can pass through and get to all of those organs. Because when the stomach swells, then it really clamps down, right? But if we can release some of that gas, then it, some of it, some of that, um, blood can get through. If we can't uh, pass a tube into the stomach right away, then we trocharize them, right? So that we can get some of the gas out. And then yes, we get fluids make like crazy, yes. All right, so what kind of drains are categorized, or I'm sorry, considered gravity dependent? Passive. Passive drains, right. So what would be considered like a passive drain? Do you know what a passive drain is? Yeah, but the name escapes me. Isn't it Penrose? Yes, a Penrose drain. Very good. Now, what about an active drain? There's a Jackson Pratt. Jackson Pratt drain, right. So what does a Jackson Pratt drain look like? Like a grenade. Yeah, like those grenades, right? 
So in order to get it to be an active drain, you basically squeeze, squeeze the Jackson Pratt and then close the little, the cap on it. And so it suctions out that fluid that might be within that, that space that you're, you know, draining out, right? The passive drain, so the Penrose drain is just in that space that you have and gravity is working so that it can just seep out any type of fluid that might be there. So it just makes everything a mess at that given point. So I always tell people like, I'm sorry, this drain is going to make your house um, really messy for the next couple of days. So, so we use those drains for like bite wounds or lacerations and stuff like that. Anyone see these drains before? Yes. Yes. I'm sure you have in term. <laughs> For some we stuff. just one on a puppy that had a bite um, abscess. Yeah. Yeah. So why, why would you put in a drain for that? Like you don't do it in every bite wound, right? Why would you put it in for that, that bite wound in particular? do the pocketing space underneath good like there was a pocketing space right so you want to make sure that we get out any type of like really gross fluid that's in there and then also want to make sure that we drain out whatever's in that pocket to close that stuff in good okay um wounds can drain excessively, causing serum to seep through the bandage and extend to an external environment. This is called what? Strike through. Strike through, right? You can have strike through on your bandage. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the suturing together of portions of gastrointestinal tract um, to allow uh, confluent ingest the flow. It is performed when damaged tissue or a tumor requires a segment of the gastrointestinal tract to be removed. Might have helped in one of these surgeries before. You know, I can picture the, the, the placement of everything and how it goes around. I can't remember the name. It happens a lot in foreign body surgeries. Let's just oh, yeah. So it is the suturing together of portions of the gastrointestinal tract to allow confluent ingestion flow. So it happens a lot when we have to cut the intestines, cut out a piece of the intestines, and then we basically put them back together. What is that called? How, what that procedure? The resectioning. Okay, so resection is basically taking out. What is it when we put it back, the, the other portions back together? It starts with an A. Anastomosis. So we, we do resection anastomosis. So put it back together as the astom anastomosis. All right, so how many of you guys have helped with little baby, baby, baby puppies before? Anyone? like new newbie puppies? Not in practice, but my dogs had a litter, so. Oh, okay. Had to take care of them. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so tail jacking and dew claw removal in puppies should be performed during which time period? 
three to five days. Three to five days. Awesome. Usually it's around three to five, or I'm sorry, three days or so. Five days is a little long. Um, all right. A patient undergoing an intercostal thoracotomy should be positioned for surgery in what position? The lateral or recumbency. Good, an intercostal thoracotomy, right? So it's going to be in between the rib space. We're going to put in lateral recumbency, right? So you have to look for keywords. I actually did this quiz, and that's this one I actually got wrong because I didn't read it. Okay. Um, what do we use stay sutures for? Usually holding like organs and uh, like we use them mostly in eyes more than anything else, but then during um, abdominal surgeries, holding a piece of organ out of the way while we work on another area. Right, yeah. So like when, um, like what procedures have you guys seen stay sutures for? Or have you? We'll use them with like masses in the eye that have to keep the sutures out of the way. So we use them there. And then okay. we'll use them so in um, foreign body surgeries as well and um, uh, cystotomies. Mm, cystotomies, very good. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Um, if you help in GDVs, they also use them too. Um, so yeah, very good. Um, perfect. Okay. If a hemorrhage or a ruptured spleen is suspected, um, what may you guys do um, for that? Would you do a thoracocentesis, an abdominocentesis, pericardiocentesis? Abdominal. Abdominocentesis, perfect, easy. Great. And then let's see. Find my last question for you. Oh, during the post anesthetic period, once a ruminant is laying in sternal recumbency without support and is no longer in danger of what, it can be left unattended. Bloat. Bloating. Very good. Great, guys. Um, awesome. Oh, wait, I have one more. Sorry. Um, what is the vaporizer setting that should be used as a baseline to provide surgical anesthesia in most cases? What times Mac? One and a half. One and a half. Very good. Perfect. Great. All right. You guys have done fantastic today. We are actually done for the day. Um, so yeah, I mean, keep up the great job. You guys are doing great. Um, next week we actually will be working on laboratory stuff. So, um, come with a bunch of questions on what you guys have. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Okay. Hey, I have a question. Yeah. How do I get to the Facebook group? Okay, so go when you go to Facebook, you should be able to go to prep, like go to VTE prep, and then write in crash course behind it, and then just um, request in, and I'll let you in. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, have a good rest of your weekend. You too. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Of course.